Okay, so thanks a lot for the opportunity to discuss uh, this paper. Um, so the question the paper tries to address is very clear. And, uh, and the question is, does the effect of physical expansion depend on whether or not uh, this, the, 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 this fiscal expansion is financed by issuing either short or long-term debt. So that's the question. Uh, the answer to the question is also very clear. Uh, the size of the fiscal multiplier is indeed higher when the fiscal expansion is financed by issuing short-term debt. And then the authors uh, basically attack this question from all possible angles. They provide a very strong uh, empirical evidence. Uh, they have a very clear and specific uh, theoretical mechanism. Uh, then they provide quantitative results. They have a number of policy implications. Uh, so as I discussed, and it's a bit difficult because uh, they've done pretty much everything I would have uh, asked them to, to do. Um, and in addition, uh, Rigas did a very good job uh, explaining it, but uh, let's see. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the empirical evidence. So as Riga said, there are two uh, uh, methodologies they are going to use. Uh, the first one is a proxy SVAR. So basically, they have a VIR with uh, these uh, four variables, government spending, uh, output, consumption, and investment. And they have uh, a proxy for exogenous government spending shocks, which sort of intuitively it works as, uh, as if it were some kind of an, an instrument. And uh, essentially, this uh, follows uh, from the literature and the papers by uh, Raimi and Raimi and Subairi. And they look at defense uh, spending shocks. Okay, so there, these are shocks which are arguably not the result of uh, business activities considerations. So they're in, in, in principle, they are exogenous. And so part of the shocks to G are provided by these exogenous shocks. So you just uh, measure the effects of these particular shocks on output, and that's how you calculate the, 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 mul the multiplier, okay? Uh, relative to the standard analysis, uh, they essentially split these shocks into two types. So there are two kinds of shocks. Uh, there are uh, shocks, fiscal shocks financed by short-term debt and fiscal shocks by, financed by long-term debts. And essentially what they do is they, they, they So they have this variable that they construct, which is the ratio of short-term debt to uh, long-term debt. And uh, depending on whether this uh, ratio increases around the time of the shock or decreases around the time of the, of the, of the shock, the shock is classified as either purely short-term finance or purely long-term uh, finance. Okay, so the paper was not 100% clear on this, but I think this is my interpretation. I think it's correct, okay? Um, well, once they do that, they can uh, obtain these uh, either both impulse response functions and uh, uh, cumulative uh, 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 multipliers. Let me just focus on the impulse response functions. So what they show uh, quite clearly is that when uh, in response to a fiscal shock that is financed by Issuing short-term debt, which is the blue, uh, output clearly increases more than in response to a fiscal shock that's financed by issuing uh, long-term debt, okay? Which are the components of output that respond uh, more? Well, uh, if you look at consumption, it's clear that consumption responds more in response to a short-term shock, whereas if you look at the investment instead, uh, you, get, uh, well, you get the difference, but the difference uh, is not statistically uh, significant. Okay. So I have a couple of just questions on, on this. Uh, so one is it is why do, why is it that they use this uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of binary classification for the shocks? Instead, they could do something like this. So given a shock, they can decomp basically every shock would have a part that's short term and a part that's uh, long term. So this one on the bottom should be a PS PLT, not PST. There is a typo there. So you can just multiply the shock by the increase in short-term debt divided by the total increase in indebtedness, the increase in long-term debt divided by the total increase in indebtedness. So basically, you'd be decomposing this shock into uh, short-term finance and long-term finance. This would add up to one. 
Uh, so there would be no need to sort of arbitrarily a shock that's sort of financed by both types of dates to, call, to classify it either as purely short term or purely uh, long term. Okay. And then the other question I had is uh, the extent to which they can actually claim that uh, the uh, investment uh, response is not different uh, in response to these new types of shocks uh, or instead they just don't have enough power to tell them apart. Uh, so it's a question that the standard errors are very large or they can uh, sort of precisely be estimated to be similar. Uh, to me, it's not very clear. Uh, I'll probably say that uh, they, it clearly consumption responds more in response to short-term finance uh, fiscal shocks, but in the case of investment, maybe they just don't have enough data or the data is not good enough to, to, to tell them apart. Okay? Uh, there is one concern that uh, the paper discusses, uh, which is, uh, so as I was reading it, I hope they would not uh, talk about this, but they actually do, so as I tell you, they've thought of everything. Um, so obviously the maturity of that can be endogenous, okay? So we can accept that the fiscal shock itself is exogenous, uh, but whether the government issues more short-term or more long-term debt, that's potentially endogenous. Um, and uh, if the government issues short-term debt when the yield curve is upward sloping, uh, or uh, not as, uh, basically when short-term debt is cheap relative to long-term debt from the point of view of the government, in addition, given that uh, the yield curves are, tend to be upward sloping uh, when in expectation of economic expansions, that could account for the correlation between short-term financing and future uh, higher growth. Okay, now the, it's true that they, the, the way they deal with this is by adding the term premium to the VAR. I mean, I'm not an big empirical person, but it's not obvious to me that this is enough to, uh, to uh, address this potential uh, concern. But again, so that's, that's what they do. Uh, in, in general, something, something that I would like is, I would like much more about to know much more about the nature of uh, these shocks, uh, of the fiscal shocks, short-term and long-term fine. Uh, they don't show any picture, on any, any figure on that, or maybe I missed it, but for example, uh, is there any trend over time? Have, for example, fiscal shocks been financed more with long-term or short-term debt in the past than in the present? Is there any trend? Is there any cyclicality to it? Uh, I would also like to see some uh, plot of both the shocks and the short-term over long-term uh, debt over time. Again, I would like to have much more information to get a sense of the, of the nature of the shocks that they, that they use. Okay, uh, then they use uh, local projections. Uh, I don't have any specific uh, comment on this. Essentially, the, the, the methodology is standard, but they condition the effect on uh, the change in uh, this ratio of government of, of short-term to long-term debt between in the, the past. They also do it at some point by uh, interacting the shocks uh, directly with the ratio itself. So they do many different specifications, and by and large, the results uh, remain. Okay, so they find that the uh, multiplier, if you look at GDP, the multiplier is higher for short-term finance debt, and here, in fact, they find that both for consumption and for investment, uh, the difference seems to be statistically significant. So once again, they, they focus on consumption, nothing wrong with that, but it's not clear that they don't have similar results for investment. Okay. Uh, well, this is what I just said. Let me just skip this. Uh, let me just briefly mention the theoretical uh, mechanism explored in the paper. Um, the, it's actually completely intuitive, uh, so but the idea here is that uh, short-term debt provides liquidity services to agents, uh, so if agents have a liquidity shock and for some reason they would want to consume more in the future, here this is modeled as a preference shock, uh, to the extent that they have short-term debt in their portfolio, they can respond to this desire to consume more, if they don't have short-term debt in their portfolio, they cannot. And as a result, naturally, uh, having more short term around for people to be able to uh, have this extra liquidity will tend to increase consumption. So the, the, the mechanism is, is very clear. Slightly a bit more specifically, 
Now the model is sort of a new Keynesian model, it has all the usual ingredients, but there is this additional ingredient uh, that's sort of reminiscent to a, some kind of a repeated diamond dipic type of framework, uh, in which preferences, in addition to the first term, which would be sort of standard, it has also this second term. So basically each, uh, econ each period is divided into two sub-periods, and at the beginning of, the, during the first sub-period, you don't know if in the second sub-period you're going to have this liquidity shock, and if you have short-term debt in your portfolio, that's useful not only to carry uh, resources from today to tomorrow, the next period, but in addition, it's useful to be able to, uh, uh, at, at, be able to take advantage of these liquidity shocks uh, in the next uh, sub-period. So that's why there is more demand for short-term debt, uh, the uh, excess, uh, basically there is a, uh, the, the uh, average interest rates on short-term debts tend to be lower than average interest rates on long-term debts because short-term debt provides these additional uh, uh, benefits. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, the, the constraint that they introduce. Basically, the consumption in the second sub-period cannot be greater than the holdings of H&I, H&I's holdings of short-term debt. Okay, so that's assumed just like that, and of course, once you make that assumption, there is this extra, extra benefit of short-term debt. Okay, uh, so there is a direct effect of short-term debt availability on consumption. Okay, so let me just make a couple of questions. Now, the mechanism is clearly, it's clear, it seems uh, reasonable. Uh, now, this assumption is very extreme. Uh, again, it's true that short-term debt might have more liquidity, uh, provide more liquidity uh, uh, services and long-term debt, but this very, very stark difference uh, it's probably too extreme. <laughs> now, as a shortcut in a sort of simple model to uh, uh, illustrate the mechanism, I think it's perfectly fine, but I don't know, if then you want to do this uh, quantitatively, perhaps having this very, very stark differential between short-term, long-term debt, uh, I don't know, uh, perhaps it, uh, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, this is a question that I have. Uh, it seems too extreme. Um, Okay, now uh, I think this, they do talk in the paper about how uh, the results should depend on whether the overall level of debt is high or low. Now, they, at least in the, the way this is, uh, the short-term debt is, in, in, is, is brought into the model, basically there are like two regimes. There is a regime in which this uh, constraint, the constraint I showed you is sometimes binding. So as long as that constraint is sometimes binding, they're increasing the amount of short-term debt tends to be more expansionary. But at some point, you already have so much short-term debt that it's never binding. From that point onwards, uh, if you have more short-term debt or long-term debt, it's, uh, it should not make much of a difference, okay? So basically what this suggests is that for when the levels of debt are low, then the optimal debt maturity should tend to be more short-term because whatever debt you have, you want it to be short-term to provide these liquidity services. And in addition, the multiplier should be higher when it's financed with short-term debt. But for high levels of debt, this should be different. The, this, this, this difference should not be that relevant. So debt maturity should be more long-term because there are the usual uh, hedging uh, benefits. And in addition, the fiscal multiplier should not depend on whether they are the spending is financed by short or long-term debt. Okay, so oh, I'll have short comments on uh, something on the policy, but I don't see the slide. But so one issue that I th thought that there, at some point there, in, there was this issue of the so-called Operation Twist, in which you had the government, uh, I guess it was uh, buying long-term debt, selling short-term debt. Uh, the, the idea there was that this would be expansionary because you wanted to bring down long-term uh, interest rates. The methodology here suggest, provides a way of actually measuring the effect of this operation twist because at the end of the day, the difference between financing the spending with long-term or short-term debt, that difference should directly measure the effect of this operation twist here uh, instead of the, if the mechanism being the result of a reduction in long-term debts is more directly the idea that there are these additional short-term debts that you provide. So if you have uh, some liquidity needs, uh, this should be uh, more, very, more expansionary. 
Uh, overall, this is a very nice paper. It's quite convincing. It's obviously uh, highly relevant. It's still somewhat preliminary, but uh, it has lots of potential, and I look forward to the next version.